I'm going to follow my leader, Bob Collins, use the same format. The, the paper presenters will have 15 minutes. The discussants will have 10 minutes each. And the rebuttals, if you will, or re responses to the discussants uh, will be several minutes each, depending on how we're doing with time. Our first paper that we're going to have presented is uh, the Rock US Alliance, which is our overall topic today, and the third offset strategy presented by Dr. Patrick Cronin and Mr. Sangwon Lee. So I'll let Patrick start. General Talelli, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, General Kim and the two councils, and especially Dave Maxwell and Georgetown University's Center for Strategic Studies. Um, we um, have only given you a preliminary paper, which we revised but did not circulate to our discussants. I now realize that was a strategic mistake because they don't have actually our revised paper. However, let's, in 15 minutes, the two of us uh, hit some of the highlights of this paper, which we wrote as part of a project we're working on at the moment at the Center for New American Security. The strategic landscape in which the Korean Peninsula is operating it often seems static, but in fact, like the rest of the world, it's always ever-changing. We heard General Chun uh, talk about how great, with great power comes great responsibility. That's actually a quote that goes back to the, the Bible, the French Revolution, Churchill, FDR, Teddy Roosevelt, and others. Um, but um, the question here is whether the United States can continue to carry out the role it has played since World War II and defend its interests and defend its allies far forward by being able to project power into the face of opposing force. And increasingly that's called into question because of the diffusion of long range precision strike munitions. Um, and this is something that in late 2014, the current Obama administration uh, marshaled a response called the third offset strategy, essentially an attempt to harness leading edge technology as well as new concepts of operations to try to counteract um, the ubiquitous precision guided munitions uh, around the world um, with particular focus on China and with the emerging um, a reemergence of great power tensions with, with China as well as with Russia. This was accelerated in many ways because they had such enormous national capabilities in the case of China rapidly uh, rising in terms of military expenditures as well. Um, but we also believe that this is critically important to think through with respect to the Korean Peninsula in three specific ways that we are trying to address in our chapter uh, in, this, in this paper. Um, one is in terms of just being able to deter North Korean actions and possibility of the use of force. Second is to especially reinforce extended deterrence the idea that the United States has the will and capability to come to the defense of our mutual interests and to our defense of the Korean allies. Um, and three, that there might also be ancillary benefits in terms of empowering uh, a middle power like the Republic of Korea to have a, a bigger footprint rather than a lighter footprint in regional security. We think it punches below its weight uh, relative to its, uh, really its global stature. Not that that's gonna be a priority while North Korea is priority number one, two, and three, but at relatively little expense and investment through information and other means, uh, we think there's a role to be played there. We're really gonna focus here on the Korean contingencies um, for the sake of this uh, pa paper and uh, conference uh, right now. Um, it was Secretary uh, of Defense Chuck Hagel at the time in November 2014 who rolled out the third offset strategy and he actually referenced North Korea. So it's not as though North Korea was not on their minds. He talked about this as well as even non-state terror uh, actors like Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah uh, are able to um, essentially tap democratized technologies that are now able to uh, have the same kind of anti-access and area denial capabilities that we were attributing largely to China's counter-intervention um, uh, force as, as the Chinese fashion their modernization to expand their influence and positive control over air and sea domains in particular around the, the Sanhai, the three seas, the yellow, 
East China and South China Seas. Um, and um, the third offset strategy has been very much focused since then um, in Asia on, on countering and trying to overcome these A280 capabilities of China. In fact, at CNAS, we are currently working on a project that looks at China's uh, abilities and capabilities to do that, and um, we think through some counter strategies. But we're thinking in this paper about why this applies to the Republic of Korea uh, and to Korean contingencies. And to do that, you, you have to start thinking about the threat that North Korea poses. And in our project, our longer project, in fact, General Chun uh, has written a wonderful uh, draft paper um, that's part of this uh, forthcoming volume that we'll release in the fall, where he reminds us that North Korea has its own offset strategies, as any adversary would. Uh, its original offset strategy was essentially a political and psychological strategy um, to try to essentially um, make the United States and South Korea think that they might be engaged in a protracted, long, unwinnable war, um, something like Vietnam, perhaps, um, that would, uh, again, make the use of force untenable. Uh, in the first instance. Now, more recently, of course, this latest offset strategy of North Korea is seizing upon not just nuclear weapons and missiles, but also a whole range of asymmetric means from the chemical and biological, radiological uh, deterrent, uh, but also um, uh, <coughs> drones uh, and unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, GPS jamming, cyber warfare, um, covert uh, forces, um, but even uh, very precise long-range munitions like the new 300-millimeter uh, multiple launch rocket system. These systems um, at the full spectrum can call into question the extended deterrence uh, in the U.S. umbrella protecting the Korean Peninsula from, from resumption of war. Um, and we think that's a problem. And there are really four ways in which the saliency of extended deterrence might be undercut. Um, and it's not just from North Korea. It's also first from China's successful military modernization. It may be that simply China's growing um, capabilities, uh, especially if political signals were sent in the future that China would uh, essentially block an American intervention or at least raise the cost and the risk of any American intervention, that could cripple the extended deterrence, at least the perception and therefore the psychological element of it. Secondly, it could be weakened by uh, North Korea's nuclear arsenal. And here the tipping point we're most uh, focused on in the next uh, coming few years uh, is the potential deployment of a nuclear armed intermediate range or, or intercontinental range ballistic missile. There are obviously other types, but we can go into these issues. Uh, um, a third means uh, would be um, if compromised by other asymmetric threats from cyber to the conventional munitions I mentioned. And a fourth might be simply a US uh, sort of Brexit from the world, a diversion into other crises or inward lookingness that takes us away. There are a number of ways, in other words, that the US extended deterrence could be uh, further eroded in the perception of regional experts, including inside North Korea. And that could have devastating consequences for war and peace on the peninsula. So we think a third offset strategy could have potential benefits. Um, the most important way the third offset can help preserve extended deterrence is analogous to how it is intended to help preserve US power projection capability um, against other A2 AD effects. So at a minimum, third offset technologies and concepts of operations might be able to avoid the current trend in North Korean nuclear and missile programs, a trend that threatens to erode the credibility of our nuclear umbrella in defense commitment. And more ambitiously, a third offset strategy could catalyze the search for a new alliance strategy to regain the initiative, both in this period of unstable peace, but also in the midst of potential future crises. Um, and the aim of this latter ambition should be to bend North Korea to eventually accede to relinquishing its dream of becoming a recognized nuclear weapon state and committing e even lethal acts of provocation. There are a number of potential risks as well. Uh, and in our revised paper, we talk about some of the risks of a third offset strategy. Just briefly, increasing the chances that a crisis could escalate to nuclear war, that's possible. North Korea could have a use it or lose it kind of mentality if the alliance is so capable. Secondly, driving up defense costs that only further uh, call into question domestic political support here in the United States for sustaining forward-based alliances. And thirdly, widening the technological gap between the allies um, that could create political tensions as well. We think those obstacles can be managed, um, but they need to be thought through. And that's why we wrote this paper, and that's why we're writing this project, 
because it's very important for the alliance to think through it. And I want Richard Xiongwan to at least uh, talk a little bit about, uh, if he has a minute or two, um, General Tlele, to talk about um, some of the other implications. Thank you, Dr. Cronin. Uh, I believe I, and I hope that I'm the youngest uh, panel right now, so I, I would do my best try to uh, try to make it short and candid as possible. And uh, you're right that in uh, the, the third officer strategy isn't by no means like the, the precious uh, nuclear sword that North Korea likes to say, but uh, it does have some practical and huge uh, intersections that we might need to look into you know, in considering the uh, rock's defense environment and the Korean Peninsula. So as General Chun mentioned in his uh, keynote speech, uh, the capabilities are rising, but the numbers of the personnel are actually shrinking. And that is a, a worldwide uh, phenomenon, I think. And so uh, where can these third officer strategies be used? First, first example is the man and unmanned uh, machine teaming. Uh, so we might be able to use uh, or at least enhance the perimeter uh, reconnaissance uh, capabilities by introducing these robotics and uh, human controlled monitoring devices. And this will have, as you can see, uh, during the uh, landmine incident uh, that happened quite a f only a, a fun few months ago that it might be able to uh, bring us to a new level. Another one is under, unmanned underwater vehicles. Uh, we all know that the uh, threat of North Korea is largely naval, and uh, right now it, it comes from the underwater uh, uh, beneath the ocean. So uh, these robots that are capable of hunter-killer operations by their own might actually send a signal to Pyongyang not to deplore this, uh, these submarines in a more offensive manner. Another uh, capability that we might need to look into is missile defense, and there's two aspects of these missile defenses. First of all is the... the operational concept that we can uh, always join the uh, missile defense capabilities such as the Aegis platforms that Rock Japan and Uni United States all have in order to create a triangular grid of uh, Aegis and censoring uh, defense capabilities. Also is the much more specific level where we can mount these guns and these uh, close-in weapon systems, if you will, to these uh, individual platforms so that we can increase the survivability as well as uh, lead these, let these uh, fleets uh, go far into the ocean without being compromised by North Korean uh, defenses. And another one is that we can bridge the gaps between ASEAN and uh, the United States third office strategy itself by providing the, the technology and the industry and the training that uh, the ROC and the United States have shared for quite a long time and uh, to make the best use of these encyclopedias of experience that we have uh, in order to foster the uh, multilateral environment and uh, capability sharing. And that is also not, in, not to be limited to uh, C4ISR or transparency issues, but like the uh, physical and uh, actual systems themselves. And lastly, the, the one that I would like to act, that actually just came up with this, is that uh, as a young Korean national, I think that General Chun is very right in that uh, the, the, the very problem right now is the mentality of the South Koreans. But uh, I would say that uh, this, North Korea has the same problem. They think that our weaknesses is, lies in, within the, uh, the domestic political system, but that's the same for North Korea as well. They are too dependent upon the monarchical uh, system that uh, just think of a colony of ants. If you get rid of the uh, queen ant, then they stop fighting. And uh, I'm not sure if this is like an adequate response, but uh, if you were the queen ant, what would you think uh, if the exterminator comes to you and it points the extermination to your head or to the uh, warrior ants or the uh, work working ants that they are actually fighting for? So. The thing is that uh, we need to get into the sixth domain, which many people try to pinpoint as the domain of psychology. And the psychology in these North Korean leaders is, in fact, I would say is very uh, easily compromisable by the third officer strategy itself because we have these new technology weapons and we are bringing these precision guided weapons to a new degree so that we can uh, always counter these uh, or actually pose a direct threat to the North Korean leadership. So I would say that that's, that is some part that we need to think of integrating into the kill chain or the uh, Korea air missile defense system that we need. And I would stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I would now ask Mr. Kim to present his paper. More of a concept um, and technology is maybe. We'll I think uh, my presentation is uh, more focused on the uh, you know domestic politics in South Korea in terms of a U.S. rock alliance, which have has been covered extensively uh, today. Uh, I'm going to try to answer uh, this question. Uh, did North Korea's fourth nuclear test earlier this year uh, strengthen the U.S. rock alliance, or? Has it thrown aspects of the alliance into doubt? South Korea and the U.S. responded to North Korea's fourth nuclear test and the subsequent long-range rocket launch with strong and coordinated measures, including tougher U.N. sanctions on North Korea. And the U.S. reaffirmed its firm commitment to the defense of South Korea by dispatching its strategic assets in response to North Korea's nuclear and missile provocations. In a continuing show of force, the two allies conducted uh, the largest joint military exercises to date. And Seoul decided to make a bold move to strengthen the U.S. ROC alliance by departing from its strategic ambiguity on the U.S.-made THAAD system. Immediately after North Korea's long-range rocket launch on February 7, the Park government made an official announcement that the two allies had agreed to begin negotiations for the earliest possible deployment of the advanced missile system, uh, defense system to the South Korea. To the, uh, South Korea. Uh, despite China's uh, vehement opposition, that deployment is expected to have political significance in terms of U.S. strategic reassurance for the defense of South Korea and uh, significantly improve joint U.S. ROC early warning capabilities and to allow South Korea to be part of a U.S.-Japan ROC theater missile defense system that has been long desired by the U.S. However, it is also true that North Korea's fourth nuclear test evoked new calls in South Korea for the development of an independent nuclear option. The scope and scale of discussion was expanded with greater media attention than the previous tests. Not only Cho Son Ilbo, the most influential conservative daily newspaper in South Korea, but also the ruling Senuri Party's leadership, including Won Yu Chol, then floor leader, led the call for nuclear armament. Their move basically revealed uh, the lack of confidence in the durability of American security commitments, including the extended deterrence against North Korea. And some Korean newspapers suspected that the floor leader Won Yu Chol's remarks were deliberate and carefully coordinated with, or at least implicitly blessed by the Blue House. President Park and the ruling Senator Party might have aimed to signal to Washington and Beijing that more powerful measures should be taken against uh, the North Korean nuclear advances. More importantly, considering the timing and uh, political context, the debate over nuclear armament may have uh, more to do with the <coughs> upcoming National Assembly election in uh, last uh, April. The pro-nuclear politician strategy might have been to secure solid support from the voters by drawing media attention and giving the impression of acting tough against North Korea's growing nuclear threat. It is noteworthy that the pro-nuclear view is mainly driven by feelings of profound frustration and helplessness over North Korea's growing nuclear threat. They tend to lack realistic plans to improve South Korea's security and strengthen deterrence against North Korea with a nuclear option. Furthermore, they are unable to suggest reasonable ways to avoid or minimize the economic and security causes associated with going nuclear. However, it is unrealistic to simply wait and hope for pro-nuclear sentiment, I would say sentiment here, to fade away. It will persist barring a significant breakthrough in the North Korean nuclear problem, I think. With another nuclear test by the North, the reliability of U.S. extended uh, 
deterrence will become increasingly questioned in South Korea. So I think to assuage concerns, Washington should start seeking new methods of reassuring Seoul that its security commitments are solid. One reassuring method, a measure that Washington or the next incoming US president could immediately take is, as Admiral Dennis Blair stated, uh, to make an authoritative statement that warns Pyongyang of the military realities it faces. And I quote, I would, it would be suicidal for the Kim regime to initiate either a major conventional attack across the DMZ or to use any kind of a weapon of mass destruction against the Republic of Korea, unquote. And the permanent deployment of US strategic submarines in the waters near the Korean Peninsula is another option suggested by some Korean experts for the US to lend uh, credibility to its security uh, guarantees. Arguments for the redeployment of US nuclear weapons will keep resurfacing as the North Korean nuclear threat continues to grow. And it is time for the US at least to start to review the wisdom of this kind of measure. In addition, when time is right, we must begin to consider the um, resumption of long-term diplomatic efforts for a comprehensive security settlement with North, uh, with North Korea. This is gonna be the second part of my presentation today. Uh, the challenges of the US rock alliance sparked by North Korea's nuclear test this year also came from the liberals' fierce criticism of the Park government's decision to start talks with Washington on that deployment. Opponents of that emphasized potential security anxiety associated with that deployment which they argue will escalate regional tensions and introduce a new Cold War, endangering peace on the Korean Peninsula. They argue that that deployment is an invitation for diplomatic troubles with China and Russia, given that the two powers perceive that uh, deployment as a security threat. Indeed, the Chinese ambassador to South Korea warned that that deployment could, quote unquote, destroy PRC rock bilateral relations in an instant. The opponents are concerned that the geopolitical developments triggered by that deployment will hurl South Korea into the center of Sino-US rivalry. South Korea would be forced to absorb China's negative response on its own. And the concern of some opponents go so far as to include the possibility of South Korea becoming China's strategic strike target. Indeed, China has indicated that South Korea will have to pay a price for that deployment. And given the fact that China's, China is South Korea's largest trading partner, many South Koreans are worried that China might retaliate South Korea against South Korea economically, including the banning certain imports from South Korea, similar to the so-called garlic trade uh, dispute in 2000. China may be cautious in taking these kinds of extreme measures against South Korea in order to avoid creating a catastrophic break in relations. However, China still holds cars that could negatively impact the South Korean economy, including discouraging Chinese uh, tourists visiting from visiting Korea and giving regulatory disadvantages to uh, Korean companies in China and symbolic Chinese moves in the airspace over or waters near the um, Iodo Island in the Korean air defense identification zone uh, that overlaps Chinese claims are also possible reactions to that. To compensate for its downgraded missile capabilities, China, Russia, and North Korea may try to acquire more missiles to overwhelm that. In that situation, China may appreciate the strategic value of North Korea in its rivalry with the US and be less motivated to curb North Korea's nuclear and missile developments, opponents argue. Recently, that has not drawn as much attention within South Korea as before, as Seoul tries to keep a low profile 
during the talks with Washington on the feasibility of uh, that deployment. After the summit meeting between Presidents Park and Xi on March 31st, Seoul has indicated its willingness to consider Chinese concerns about that deployment and to forego ex expediting its negotiations with Washington. And I think the future of that controversy in South Korea pretty much depends on the political landscape, which became very fluid after the National Assembly election in April and leading up to the presidential election in December 2017. The THAAD issue has become a political hot potato, which would easily entrap major presidential candidates. To avoid any back, uh, backlashes, the candidates will refuse to choose between China and the U.S. while placing the alliance with the U.S. at the center of South Korea's foreign policy. But at some point, I think Seoul will have to make a strategic decision and focus on damage control with Beijing. Let me stop here and thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Our last presenter, Dr. Chung, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me begin with some uh, the Murphy's Law, which is related to the uh, discussion we had so far. Well, the, uh, based on the discussion we had uh, so far, I came to realize realization that uh, the sanction being you know, in place currently is not going to have an uh, effect on the North Korea the nuclear ambitions. So the Murphy's Law said that if things are left to themselves, then uh, they tend to go from bad to worse. So if North Korea is left itself, then uh, I mean, things getting worse. So some, something that should be uh, taken as a counter, counter measure. So that's why uh, the topic, including the other topic, is about the uh, counter strategy, mostly, mostly, uh, mostly focus on uh, deterrence. So I will focus a lot on uh, the counter strategy with uh, deterrence. But uh, before, before I do that, so let me briefly uh, mention uh, about the uh, evolution of North Korea the nuclear threat and uh, how capable it is, and also what are the, uh, the reason we have to worry about those development and uh, what are the motivation underlying the North Korean nuclear development. Then, uh, like I said, uh, I go back to uh, I go to the counter strategy uh, to deal with North Korea threat. As you know, there is four rounds of tests North Korea, but. Uh, Two things uh, we need to keep in mind based on this observation uh, is that the first one is, uh, is that North Korea is now uh, capable of weaponizing uh, plutonium and uh, HEU, highly rich uranium. And also, as the number of tests uh, increase, then uh, the number of the, uh, the yield uh, is getting higher and higher. So as you know, the first one is uh, uh, 4.3 uh, in, uh, in terms of a seismic wave. Second one is 4.7. Uh, uh, the third one uh, and the fourth one, the last one is uh, 5.1 uh, magnitude of the, se the seismic wave. Anyway, so you know, the, the, in, in terms of the missile test, there was more than uh, 15 times. But uh, like, uh, you know, as, as the proverb says, the practice makes perfect. So North Korea increases a nuclear test and increases a, a ballistic missile test, then uh, it will uh, come to some conclusion. Uh, well, which, is, which, which is one uh, I like, I'd like to emphasize. The one is that the uh, miniaturization of the nuclear bomb, and the other one is uh, the re-entry vehicle that can, that can withstand the, the hot, the extreme heat Created when it uh, you enter the Earth's atmosphere. So, let me briefly look at how uh, capable those capabilities are. The first one is uh, about the uh, North Korea the min miniaturization. Uh, well, there, there, are, there are some uh, division in uh, confirming uh, whether they achieved whether no, whether the North Korea achieved the, the miniaturization of a nuclear bomb. Uh, well, the, some aspect from 
from this 38 nodes, uh, ju just, they just uh, they, uh, emphasized that the North Korea actually achieved the miniaturization. So the, the design of the, of, of the miniaturization uh, is between somewhere uh, US Mark 12 and Mark 7, and also uh, 450 kilogram uh, through uh, 750 kilogram in mass, and also 60 and between 60 and 90 centimeters in diameter. So if we are asked whether North Korea uh, achieved the nuclear the miniaturization, then uh, like I said in my favor, uh, yes, probably, rather than maybe, is more compelling answer. And those, what about the North Korea reentry vehicle? Uh, Two days ago, maybe in, 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 uh, in Korea now, three days ago, uh, US Pentagon officially confirmed that the last uh, test uh, proved uh, it was successful, uh, meaning that uh, North Korea okay, re-entry vehicle can uh, withstand the extreme heat when uh, it re-enters the atmosphere. So that's uh, the last confirmation the official made, in, uh, made by the uh, the Pentagon. So right now, the North Korea miniaturization and the, the you know, successful re-entry vehicle test is almost a fact. So why, why do we worry about the North Korea nuclear the ambition? Uh, there are lots of reasons, but uh, I, I will cover just a few things. First one is, uh, is the North Korea nuclear weapon if it's fully fledged uh, developed, then uh, it is aimed at uh, South Korea, maybe, maybe Japan, but uh, I don't think it is aimed at US, uh, United States, even, even the, the ter territory of the US States. So uh, first one is, is, a, is a really you know, the uh, important thing we need to worry about. The second thing, as you know, is just to worry about uh, the proliferation issue. Uh, and also the, uh, the third one is uh, the North Korean nuclear bomb may be, may be, may be placing uh, some strain between uh, you know, the rock and the, rock and the US uh, with uh, its, uh, the extended deterrence. As North Korea becomes more, they becomes, uh, becoming more uh, full-fledging uh, nuclear power, then uh, the strain uh, between uh, the rock and the US uh, in uh, its, its extended deterrence and may be growing. That's the, the reason uh, we need to uh, worry about. And also, another one is of the fault line uh, between uh, the U.S. and the China, uh, maybe maybe getting uh, getting worse uh, with the increasing number of nuclear in North Korea. And uh, the the region uh, underlying North Korea the nuclear ambitious is a three uh, model I would like to introduce. First, a realist secret model, and the second one is. Uh, the, the organization model was the domestic model. So then is uh, the, the norms model. So in the first model, realist model, the reason the North Korea tried to acquire nuclear weapon is uh, its security of its country and its uh, regime. So as long as they, they, they regime and the country is a threat uh, by some uh, foreign country like the US, with a nuclear weapon or the other conventional overwhelming, overwhelming uh, capabilities, then uh, those Korea should uh, try to acquire the, uh, the nuclear weapons. Uh, also, the domestic model uh, is, is about the, uh, the parochial domestic and uh, the bureaucratic interest because, uh, you know, the Kim Jong-un likes to keep uh, his regime in power and also it may be used to be uh, as a, some source of uh, the hard currency. The last one is uh, the norms model. I'm mean, just uh, Kim Jong Un or North Korea. They try to achieve the state modernity and uh, identity and the prestige. Now, what are the uh, uh, the strategy we need to develop against North Korea nuclear threat? As you know, the, there's already uh, the tailored deterrence threat in place but still on, on the development. Uh, well, you may ask a question, can uh, deterrence be uh, tailored? Uh, 
Uh, yes, uh, it can be tailored, uh, especially against North Korea, North Korean nuclear threat. Uh, generally, we are very uh, familiar with, and we uh, we have been very preoccupied with uh, one size one size fit all the approach in the deter in deterring the uh, the, the opponent threat. But in North Korea, as you know, the uh, the is North Korea behavior is very unpredictable and very opaque, and very uncertain. So in this case. Uh, the, the one we have applied in, uh, you know, during the Cold War may not be, appro may not, uh, be appropriate. So in this case, the deterrence needs to be tailored uh, in terms of the capability and in terms of the way, way we achieve the, the objective, objective. So that's why uh, Rock and US in uh, 2013 has assigned the bilateral uh, tailored deterrence strategy. And also, the, among the, the under the tailored deterrence strategy, uh, there is the nuclear umbrella, and also the uh, conventional strike, and even uh, the missile defense capability. So, what about the uh, extended deterrence? Yes, uh, it should be robust, uh, like 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 uh, General John said. But uh, in order to ensure, there should be a robust. Uh, extended deterrence and uh, the assurance of Korean security, we may think of uh, not only uh, the balance of capability, but also uh, the balance of interest for the successful uh, you know, execution of the uh, extended deterrence. If there is some the asymmetry between uh, US interest and uh, North Korea interest uh, in, uh, in the area of nuclear threat, then uh, it might be uh, the preferable, uh, preferable to uh, North Korea. So those disparities between those two, those two interests uh, may, be, may be working against the, the nuclear, the extended deterrence. And also the, the, in, in terms of uh, how uh, we address uh, those uh, disparities between uh, the, the interest. So, there may be some uh, remedies, such as uh, you know, the deployment of the, the nuclear carrier strike group, or even uh, nuclear the submarine uh, armed with uh, the ballistic missile. So those are good uh, the deterrent uh, measures uh, to uh, compensate and to rectify the difference between uh, the different interests between, Iraq, between U.S. and North Korea. And also, the, uh, we, we need to consider the, uh, the, like, uh, the, some, some information sharing and also uh, the interoperability uh, should be enhanced uh, between uh, ROC and US, uh, the US the capabilities. And uh, there is uh, the, another the, uh, the measure we, uh, we have to uh, develop is uh, the kill chain. It is actually the, the preemptive the notion of uh, dealing with North Korean nuclear threats, but maybe 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 some risk. But uh, you know, as a strategy, uh, we have to find uh, the chance to to attack preemptively if the, the situation allowed. And also, the if we miss the you know the missile uh, from the kill chain, then. Uh, I mean, we have to provide for some uh, defense measure, which is uh, the Korean air missile defense. The right now, the uh, uh, it was it was it was begun in uh, 2006 with a uh, Pac-2 and the Green Fine Raider. The right now, the Pac-3 is under the process right now. It will be completed in uh, 2020, and also three more Aegis uh, Aegis uh, equipped destroyer will be acquired soon. Even uh, SM6, SM3 uh, is now under the consideration for future purchases. I'm not sure the, how it will be uh, implemented or not. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, let me uh, give you three uh, points. First one, in order to make uh, the extended deterrence and assurance more robust and re reliable, US trans capabilities must be deployed appropriate in and around the Korean Peninsula. The second one, most cooperation between the two countries 
should be made in area of missile defense, such as ISR, the conventional precision strike capabilities, and the ways to enhance interoperability. Last one. Due to fluid and multifaceted threat from North Korea nuclear quagmire, nuclear hatching strategy needed to be considered technically and politically for South Korea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chung. We'll now have our discussions, uh, 10 minutes each, and we'll start with uh, Mark. Yeah, thank you, General. Um, I take one of the role of discussions as being to find common elements within the presentations and to tease those out. In this case, that's very easy because the three excellent presentations tie together rather comprehensively to raise some big, important questions and even to suggest a few answers. Uh, Yanho Kim provides a very helpful window on how ROK domestic politics are dealing with the questions of the North Korean threat and what should be done about it. Specifically, whether the South Koreans should develop their own nuclear weapons, uh, my answer, no. And whether it should deploy THAAD, my answer, yes. Uh, he notes the answers depend on the state of the alliance and on Seoul's calculation of its relationship with China. Uh, Dr. Kim concludes that the U.S. needs to take steps to assure the ROK of its commitment to deterrence. Now, one piece of polling data I've been trying to understand showed that if you ask the South Korean public those who believe that North Korea poses a nuclear threat to South Korea will answer about 65% roughly that South Korea needs to develop uh, nuclear weapons of its own. The number's rough, around 65%. Among South Koreans who believe that North Korea poses no nuclear threat to South Korea, about 62% say that they should develop nuclear weapons. <laughs> so there's something going on here beyond just the threat from the North whether it's about national prestige or whether it's about independence or sovereignty, but it might all not all be about the North. Uh, Pat Cronin and Sengo An Lee talk about the U.S. military's need to adapt to new military threats, and its success in doing so clearly has a lot to do with how much U.S. deterrence can be trusted. They also explain why Seoul is reasonably focused on Northeast Asia and the peninsula, while at the same time they argue that the U.S. ROK alliance has a key role to play in regional Asian Pacific security for both countries' sake. Uh, while Dr. Kim has advice for the US, uh, Cronin and Lee have advice for the ROK. Now, in the Cronin and Lee paper, there's rather a rusting metaphor of the hub and spoke system, which is how the US relationship is usually defined with its allies, hub and spoke, and they want to insert a gear into the hubs and spokes. I need to see a drawing. I, I think I understand the metaphor, but I don't quite see how it actually works mechanically. Uh, Dr. Chung explores the nature of North Korea's nuclear weapons program, offering different explanations as to what might be driving it. If you're to craft a deterrent strategy, it's clearly important to understand the role of nu nuclear weapons in North Korea's thinking. Um, there's a little bit different issue. Uh, Dr. Chung talks about the reasons for the program. A different issue is n North Korea's nuclear doctrine. Now, there are experts and analysts who have tried to go through North Korean publications and speeches and even on the edge of track two discussions to figure out what North Korea's nuclear doctrine is, and they can't really find much of one. It'd be interesting to know the roots of North Korea's nuclear doctrine, or what influences it, or who's talking about it now. Uh, we don't see anything in the publications about second strike, or survivability, or deterrence, or balances. Uh, if North Korea has a nuclear doctrine, it's on pure brinksmanship. What they say is any military conflict would lead to an uncontrollable and apocalyptic nuclear outcome. Uh, if that's how they see it, it's very difficult to think beyond denuclearization to anything like a freeze or cap. I think it is true, however, that even if uh, the nuclear doctrine is not there, having nuclear weapons creates its own thinking. Theorists talk about this as being the bootstrapping phenomenon. So maybe North Korea, once it possesses nuclear weapons, will start thinking of different ways to use them they didn't have in mind when they started the programs. One big question is whether possessing nuclear weapons would lead North Korea to engage in riskier behavior because it might believe that any counterattack to its provocations could be deterred by having a nuclear weapon. Therefore, it's safer for it to make provocations or attacks. It might also be true that North Korea may behave in a less risky way if it has nuclear weapons because North Korea may think that if it possesses nuclear weapons and has a provocation, that the U.S. ROK alliance may respond in ways to prevent the conflict from going further in a more overwhelming way. 
to try to deprive North Korea of its nuclear weaponry. Therefore, the risks go, go higher faster. It may even be true that North Korea may be concerned that having nuclear weapons may make it more cautious because it may fear that if it has them, it may, may itself use them. There may be a self-deterrence that goes on. It may also be worthwhile to think about the difference that nuclear weapons make to the North Korea's relationship with different countries. It may be North Korea will think about what the nuclear weaponry means in regard to its relationship with Japan, as well as to South Korea and the United States, or even China. What does the relationship look like between North Korea and China if North Korea has nuclear weapons? So there are more layers here to unpeel. Uh, the three papers together pose two big challenges. One is to understand North Korea's capabilities and intentions and weaknesses. How can it be deterred? The other big challenge is to understand the U.S. ROK alliance. What does the U.S. need to do to reassure the ROK of its commitment and capability? And what does the ROK need to do to maintain or even increase the U.S. commitment to the alliance? Uh, on the alliance challenge, I see great value for both the U.S. and the ROK in looking at what the alliance can do for broader regional security, including cooperating on new capabilities to deal with new kinds of threats that uh, Cronin Lee's paper described so well. Doing that would engage the U.S in continuing to commit and consult and cooperate with the ROK, I would show to the US, on the other hand, the ongoing value of the alliance. In my own work in the past on alliance cooperation, mostly in Europe, the question was always there, we talked about military cooperation, of whether we, the US, want our allies to have full spectrum defense capabilities, which means focusing on everything, which means focusing on nothing, but being able to deal with every kind of threat in every possible way or whether we preferred that our allies actually develop specializations, either in regions or in weaponry, in ways to complement the alliance's overall capability. Now, the truth is, when given this question, the US government usually opted for the full spectrum approach because the different US armed services and agencies are not, not able to agree on what we think our allies should develop as specialized capabilities. The Army, uh, Navy, and US Air Force, and the State Department have different views about what the role of alliance military capabilities should be. So I was very struck by Dr. Chung's suggestion, and I'll quote this because it was so well put. Uh, he said the ROK should create a strategic leverage so that it can demand what it needs from the US by addressing US weaknesses in the region. In other words, the ROK should possess the ability to obtain what the US needs but does not possess. I think that's brilliant, uh, and it would be very good for the ROK to do that, but the problem is trying to figure out what that actually would be. And they're not going to find out by asking us because we're not going to tell them because we can't. But it's a good idea. Uh, I would conclude by endorsing uh, General Chung and Bun's suggestion during the luncheon uh, speech he gave that the alliance uh, cannot be taken for granted. It needs constant work to keep it fresh and requires constant attention. That's why a conference like this is so helpful today. The US ROK alliance may be enduring, but it cannot be unchanging. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Jones. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, thanks for the uh, four presenters and uh, Ambassador Tokola discussants. Uh, I would like to uh, emphasize two aspects in dealing with the uh, increasing clear and present threat of North Korean nuclear missile and weapons. Uh, the first aspect is that we have to uh, emphasize the role of the United Nations. In the, in the morning session, uh, Dr. Kim uh, emphasized that continuous uh, and the stronger sanctions against North Korea is the, uh, I'm not sure, I, I understand that it's the only effective measure to counter North Korean nuclear threat. And uh, uh, in that sense, I agree totally to make use of United Nations philosophy and their rules. Uh, historically, the Republic of Korea has been involved very heavily with the uh, uh, United Nations uh, philosophy and, and uh, its role. 
from the establishment of the Republic and also in the time of the Korean War, uh, United Nations, our, our best uh, friend, United Nations mobilized and uh, make use of United Nations uh, ca uh, capacity to help uh, the Republic of Korean, uh, Korean government establishment also to uh, appeal the worldwide opinion uh, to, to, uh, to help uh, South Korean government against the North Korean invasion in the time of Korean War. And after getting some uh, strong resolution from the United Nations, then UN, uh, United, U United States uh, could uh, be very easy to mobilize uh, personnel, uh, military personnel and budget. Or budget. And that is the uh, fundamental frame that we, the Republic of Korea, should, should pursue to get help to work uh, in the sense of the international relation uh, aspect. So uh, if you uh, uh, review in, in shortly the develop, development of a Korean uh, uh, ROK uh, history, you can clearly uh, understand that how important the role of the United Nations and, and its uh, philosophy. Uh, you see, uh, Korea, as you know, Korea, South Korea or North Korea, Korean Peninsula is surrounded by the big powers, Japan, uh, China, and Russia. Uh, so even though the United States wanted to help to establish uh, Korean, uh, new Korean government uh, in 1943, uh, with the declaration of the uh, title declaration, the uh, United States tried to uh, appeal through the uh, uh, postum declaration and the Yalta uh, agreement, and also after after 1945, uh, they held the uh, U.S. Uh, Soviet uh, Commission to solve the. 38th parallel and uh, to establish new united uh, Korean uh, free government. However, they failed. And only they uh, went to the United Nations uh, to hold general election to establish uh, Republic of Korea. So that is the main uh, frame that uh, our peninsula could solve the all the problem surrounding uh, our peninsula and also to unite uh, the divided country of North and South uh, Korea. So I think that uh, we have to, we have to, U US and the Korean alliance uh, should uh, uh, pursue how to, uh, how to get uh, more cooperation and uh, help from United Na through United Nations. So uh, in 1950s, even uh, United Nations Security Council uh, showed uh, and gave the clear way how to unite this divided country. So you mean um, uh, Mac General MacArthur was commanded to uh, cross over 38th parallel with the uh, order that you should uh, uh, decompose the military power to, uh, to, to have the uh, free and uh, democratic uh, general election to, to elect uh, representative and, and, uh, you, and uh, with the uh, 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 with the uh, representative of North Korea, add it to South Korea, then we can, then we can have a, a unification, uh, unified, unified government. And they clearly uh, depicted the two-day effects about the unification uh, ways. So uh, in the discussion, uh, how to 
how to promote international atmosphere to, uh, to restrain, to, uh, to uh, deter North Korean uh, nuclear threat or political uh, diplomatic threat or psychological threat, we should consider how to promote the uh, to how to promote the corporate help from through United Nations. That is the first aspect I would like to uh, propose. And the second is that second aspect of the uh, solving uh, Korean uh, North, North Korean nuclear threat is that why don't we uh, have a uh, why don't you, why don't you have a collaboratory science and technology uh, uh, step? You mean uh, in in 1940s there were a pool of higher powerful how high power, powerful destructive weapons all around the, the world, and uh, uh, at the end end stage of the Second World War. Uh, United States invented nuclear weapon and uh, solved the whole problem at, at the time. However, nowadays nuclear weapon has been uh, <coughs> produced and accumulated to a very dangerous uh, situation. So we need uh, another step of science and technology to overcome, uh, to neutralize or sterilize the uh, nuclear weapon and its carrying system. I mean, uh, such as uh, such as a laser laser weapon and the ele other electronic uh, weapons that can uh, theoretically uh, neutralize the uh, the uh, nuke nuke. Uh, uh, how can I say nuke power? They can they can uh, suppress in the early stage of uh, detonating nuclear weapon, or in the air, or in the last stage, they can uh, theoretically they can uh, neutralize a nuclear weapon. So I think that theoretically there is no problem to develop such kind of a strong uh, laser beam and also other electronic uh, weapons. So I think that it is time to uh, mobilize uh, uh, scientists and the technician to, to go into the uh, higher uh, stage to develop anti-nuclear weapon uh, device. So I think that uh, in, uh, in uh, discussing to, to uh, strengthen uh, U.S.-Korean alliance, uh, we should uh, pursue to have the uh, highest, higher uh, stage of, of science, scientists and uh, technician uh, cooperation research to uh, devise such kind of the uh, uh, high capability uh, nuclear, nuclear weapon, nuclear weapon uh, neutralization device. So I think that uh, it is not uh, impossible if we combine the uh, uh, super brain of the scientist to, to do such kind of the uh, big uh, endeavor as that was in uh, 1944 uh, un under the Manhattan uh, program. So that is two aspects. And uh, the panel or uh, presenters, if you have any uh, idea or uh, answer to my question, to my idea, I, I'm very pleased to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Bechtel. Well, I uh, just want to thank uh, everybody on the panel for making such a good presentation. I'm the last guy, um, so I'm going to talk about our uh, speakers, our panelists, one by one, uh, beginning with Mr. Lee and Dr. Cronin. By the way, thank you for both of you sitting up here. You've got us crammed in here so tight. I feel as if I should be slow dancing with Mark. I don't know, what do you think, something by the Beatles or, you know, bread maybe? I don't know. 
Um, uh, I'm working on a project with Pat and with General Tolelli on, uh, on exactly the subject matter that uh, Mr. Lee and Dr. Cronin talked about. And speaking of that, uh, Dr. Cronin may look young, but I got my PhD uh, 16 years ago, almost 17 years ago, and in my dissertation I quoted Dr. Cronin numerous times in his works. So he is a no fooling mentor of mine, even though he didn't know it and probably doesn't want to admit it either. But, uh, <laughs> um, but the, the interesting thing about uh, offset strategy is um, it, it seems to be just, and you guys addressed this, it seems to be much like um, other capabilities that the North Koreans have had. We've always looked at China and now Russia as well first, but the DPRK just keeps poking its head up there. And I, I think that's the same case here. Um, North Korea, their offset strategy seizes on asymmetric capabilities, something they've been doing really since the late 1990s, as you know, guys like General Ayers and General Tolelli know, because they were planning against that threat back then. Um, I think what it means to what we're writing about and talking about today with Pat's paper and, and Mr. Lee's paper is, is uh, they really put that on steroids now the past four years. It is, it is mind-boggling, um, the developments that North Korea has gone through in, uh, in the past four years. And I'll talk a little bit about that before I shut up. Um, I like what they said about crippled extended, extended deterrence. What does that really mean? It really means that they're trying to do, in a very sophisticated way, the same thing they've been trying to do for many years, and that's drive a wedge into the alliance. That has always been a goal of the North Koreans. That has not changed. They've just become more sophisticated in it. And Pat talked about uh, nuclear-tipped missiles. Let me address the Musadon launches that so many people poo-pooed um, that recently occurred. Two months ago, the North Koreans launched the first Musadon missile from the Korean Peninsula. They've launched them from Iran once before in 2006. Um, and we can talk about that later if you want. Two months ago, it went from exploding on the pad two months ago to a few days ago, absolutely fulfilling everything that missile was supposed to fulfill. Way up high in the air on a trajectory that if it went that way could hit Guam, which by the way has some of the best beach bars in the Western Pacific. I spent two wonderful years there when I was in the Marine Corps. I don't want to see that go away. Um, so, I, I mean, it's very important. Let's, let's not call something a partial success that was a complete success. And keep in mind that the North Koreans and everybody else who has ballistic missiles typically launches them in volleys. So let's say this was a real world conflict and they launched six Musadon missiles at Guam. Um, Let's say five of them fail. Only one hits. It's got a nuclear warhead with an HEU warhead on it. They kill 60,000 people in an instant. So this is a very real threat, and they just proved to us they can hit U.S. sovereign territory um, with it. So I think that's very interesting. Um, addressing the uh, landmine incident, I think that's very, very important. Uh, Mr. Lee talked about that. I think that shows us that the North Koreans continue to address the four things I always talk about for violent provocations, which, by the way, is in my third book, The Last Days of Kim Jong-il, available on Amazon.com for $24.95. <laughs> See your bookstore today. Um, and that's constantly changing TTP, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, the North Koreans, you know, what, what had the rocks and even Americans been training for for, for the previous years for provocations before that incident on the DMZ. They'd been trained for stuff in the NLL, right? Because we're always practicing for the last thing that happened. And what did they do? They almost killed two rock soldiers. They injured badly, both of them, um, using a completely different type of provocation. Very interesting and something we should really keep in mind. Talking about my good friend, Yan Ho Kim, whose stuff I've been reading for, what, 15 years? The guy's very talented. Um, don't let him tell you anything else. Um, I liked what he said about extended deterrence. I'm sure General Tolelli and General Ayers would agree with me and General Kim when I say we're not abandoning extended deterrence, but we should, uh, uh, we should clearly reassure our allies of that from time to time because, you know, we're not abandoning the rocks, but they need to just be reassured from that from time to time. And let me say something real quickly about that that I wrote down here. 
that I have seen in numerous articles written in academic journals over the past three or four years, and it's just idiocy, okay? Deterrence works, so we don't need to do it anymore. Really? Because what's that saying is, okay, we've deterred the North Koreans from attacking in a large-scale conflict since 1953, so let's go now. What? You know, deterrence worked in, using another corollary, deterrence worked with NATO in Europe right up until the very day that Rush, the Soviets were no longer a threat to us. And that's exactly what we need to do on the Korean Peninsula. I just hope everybody keeps that in mind. And I'll shut up here in about three minutes. Um, Dr. Chung, I thought you gave a very interesting paper. So let me comment on a couple of things. One, nuclear capability miniaturization. What miniaturization really means is a 500 kilogram HEU warhead designs of which the Pakistanis originally got from the Chinese that we saw after the Libyans gave up their program in 2003. The North Koreans have that. I would assess they probably had the capability in the warhead by about 2010. For a no-dong, they may have it already for missiles like the KN-08 um, and the Musudan, very likely. Uh, missile test reentry vehicle. How many people here saw the picture, the actual picture of that reentry vehicle being tested? How many people have seen a picture of the reentry vehicle? Yeah. How many people have seen Three Faces of Eve? Joanne Woodward, 1958 Academy Award winning performance. But I digress. Um, very compelling stuff. I think that reentry vehicle, um, if it's not proven already, it's real close to it. And let me slightly disagree with Dr. Chung on one thing, and that's that North Korea is deve not developing its missiles to strike the United States. If that's what you said, please tell me if I misunderstood you. I think they're developing some missile systems specifically to strike the United States. Please allow me to state those three systems. The Tapodong. You don't need a Tapodong to hit South Korea. The um, Musudan. Why do you need a 4,000 kilometer range missile to hit anything in South Korea or even Japan? And of course, the KN-08, which can, if it's tested uh, and works, can hit the west coast of the United States but not Texas. Um, and finally, um, and my daughter goes to school at Iowa, so she's safe. Um, but let me talk about one last thing, and that's the kill chain. And again, uh, these are my views. Not all people agree with that. But I would just suggest to our South Korean allies, and there are many of them here today, you know, stop it, you guys. You know, it, the kill chain isn't going to save one life in Seoul. The kill chain goes after them. It's not BMD. And the South Koreans need to join the US-led ballistic missile defense system. They need to do that tomorrow, if they could. And South Korea needs to, they already ordered PAC-3s, they need to get SM-3s, and they need to continue to upgrade their BMD as part of the US system, because that's what's going to protect your citizens in time of war, not the kill chain. Just a word of advice. And I'll stop there, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, we'll, we'll now uh, go uh, to our presenters and start with Dr. Chung. Yeah. First, uh, to uh, the Mr. Mark Takola. You told about that there's no uh, the official the, uh, doctrine uh, in the use of uh, North Korea, the nuclear weapons. I, I have a, different, a, little, a little bit different uh, view from you, sir. You know, the, uh, before the Colombia discovered the new continent, but still they existed the uh, new continent. So the fact that we don't find anything does not necessarily mean that, that those, uh, those uh, do not ex exist. So I believe there exists a uh, the doctrine for the use of uh, North Korean nuclear threat, nuclear, nuclear weapons. But uh, one of those is uh, no first use. Well, we, we discussed this morning, but I think uh, North Korea intentionally, uh, you know, expressed uh, just one, uh, the, you know, the phrase, uh, no first use. But there's lots of logic uh, behind the, the no first use. It's just doctrine. Uh, it's part of doctrine. Now, there are some uh, condition uh, for uh, those, those, those doctrine to work. If your country do not attack my, my country or my any territory, my people, then uh, 
Ireland used first uh, nuclear weapon against you. It is, uh, it is originates from the uh, NSA negative secret assurance. So uh, don't worry about, uh, you, you do not have a nuclear weapon, but I have a nuclear, nuclear weapon, but uh, I will attack unless you attack you know, my country, my territory, my, my you know, people, my, even my ally, then uh, I'll attack. So that's the way of uh, you know, assuring the uh, security against the opponent. So those could exactly uh, apply this uh, doctrine to a uh, you know, neighbor country, including South Korea. If North Korea, under this uh, doctrine, uh, you know, the, may, uh, may provoke some uh, military armed conflict, but uh, it is not, uh, you know, the, we don't know, uh, it, it was caused by uh, North Korea, then uh, even, even uh, our principle, according to our principle, we may uh, retaliate immediately. North Korea may think that, well, we have uh, no first use, but uh, if we attack first, then I will use a uh, nuclear weapon. Then uh, there's nothing we can do. So it has uh, some uh, strategic effect. So it, it intentionally, you know, the, uh, to be ambiguous. So there should be nuclear doctrine. The other one is you talk about the, uh, uh, the, the inoperability on a strategic level, rugged and US, between rugged and US Navy. Uh, as, as I understand, the US, uh, has a lack of uh, the mine sweeping, mine hunting capability in the uh, East Asia region, but uh, <coughs> Korea uh, has uh, some uh, capability, you know, in the region. Uh, they can, we, we can perform more than more than U.S. So in this case, well, U.S. support and uh, increase uh, where where we we lack something, then we can we can do also the uh, in reverse way. So U.S. lack the uh, mine sweeping, mine hunting capability. We can do that. So it's a uh, it's, uh, it's uh, inoperability on a strategic level. So that's uh, the, uh, the uh, one possibility. And also the uh, Dr. Dr. Bechtel, Bruce Bechtel, uh, you, you mentioned that the, uh, North Korea will not attack USA with uh, nuclear weapons. Well, we have, we have to differentiate from uh, the attack and the deterrence. So, North Korea may use a uh, nuclear weapon for deterrence purpose, like to prevent augmentation uh, from you know, the US, US to in, in South Korea. But uh, will not attack, I mean, first attack uh, with a uh, nuclear weapon against the uh, against USA. So that's why uh, I said North Korea will not attack, but still it will use just for deterrence purpose. And, uh, you know, the, you, you said, uh, uh, you know, it kill chain uh, maybe maybe not maybe maybe not useful. Uh, so the more useful one is uh, to the cooperation or even integrate the Rock uh, KMD and the USMD. But uh, you know, it's lots of the uh, conflict between those two uh, issue. But anyway, what I what I am trying to say uh, through my paper is to enhance the interoperability uh, with uh, you know the those two uh, missile defense system. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Kim. Yes, um, I think I tried to deal with uh, very controversial issues in South Korea in a way uh, that won't produce any controversy. And uh, based on what I heard from the commentators, uh, I think I did a Good job. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what kind of uh, questions or comments I can uh, I will get from the floor, but so far that's my judgment. Uh, just briefly touching on uh, the polling issue that uh, Mark raised, I think we should keep in mind that the public opinion uh, portrayed by surveys uh, in any country, I guess, is only a, a snapshot of people's emotion. Uh, especially in this case, uh, you know, the nuclear uh, armament in response to North Korea's nuclear test. And I don't think uh, they do this kind of survey on a monthly basis. So if you do uh, that, uh, you know, the monthly survey, you may find a fluctuation of public opinion uh, depending on what kind of provocations North Korea makes. And uh, 
the respondents, uh, I understand, are rarely informed of the, uh, the magnitude of economic and um, you know, energy costs associated with uh, going nuclear. If you, they are informed of uh, that kind of information, they may uh, you know, answer in a different way, I guess. Uh, for example, uh, do you, are you willing to um, see uh, your home city host uh, uh, storage facilities for a nuclear arsenal? By the way, uh, that uh, storage will be North Korea's top military target. <laughs> then you, know, you, you would hear a different answer, I guess. So the, the contents and structure of the survey questionnaire uh, reflects, uh, reflecting these potential concerns could result in different level of uh, uh, public support of uh, nuclear uh, options. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cronin. Well, thank you. Um, really excellent um, comments, and as well as the, uh, my, my colleagues uh, in terms of papers, let me just uh, give you five Ps here um, in terms of reactions. One of them is extended deterrence. Really nothing new since Robert Jervis, perception and misperception. I mean, we're in the same, this is a psychological um, and judgment call more than a specific, precise, quantifiable um, uh, challenge, and um, it's, a, it's one that you have to work at constantly, and with this rapidly shifting environment, I think we've made the case, and we can make the case, that um, extended deterrence requires serious work, um, just to stand still even, and uh, that's what we're trying to get at. Secondly, politics, um, a couple of thoughts here, one in Dr. Chung's very good paper, the idea that the ROK would be satisfied domestically in terms of politics with respect to just filling the gaps for Americans. I would love to see that as an American. I don't know if that's realistic in terms of domestic politics. Um, so uh, one of the, um, and maybe that's not what he's suggesting, but one doesn't want to go too far down that division of labor. Um, we've tried this in the past. On missile defense issue, the political issue here really between especially Seoul and Beijing, one of the points I would uh, make would be Chinese negotiating tactics, which is if Chinese smell blood, you know, they'll seize it. Um, if they sense weakness, they'll put that wedge right there. And what they've sensed is the weakness in the sense that the alliance has been unwilling to make a firm decision to commit to that. Once that decision is announced, I suspect the Chinese will start to quiet down a bit um, because they know it's not actually a threat to them. Um, and they'll know that, oh, the decision's made. The challenge with that is unfortunately, even though once the decision is announced, perhaps next month at the two plus two, um, the de deployment would actually take 18 to 24 months. So the Chinese may still find lots of room there to drive a wedge, and that's, that's a challenge. Three, um, the pocketbook here. Um, we're describing, or Defense Department, my former boss, Robert Works, describing with the third offset uh, strategy and its associated technology, some very expensive hardware. Um, we've outlined in our paper some of the investments that are actually being made in this fiscal year and our plan for the next five years, but real tough trade-offs when you talked about deploying any of these systems. Um, if you're talking about directed energy weapons, uh, suddenly replacing um, more uh, sort of old-fashioned missile defense technology, for instance, that's going to be very expensive. So there will really be some constraints. That leads to a fourth issue, which is people. Um, there's nothing like boots on the ground to go back to that psychological reassurance about deterrence here and, and real commitment. And in the past, the United States has often tried to substitute technology for our army uh, presence on the ground. There's really uh, a tough trade-off there. The United States is in a position, as we all know, where it is looking for allies to do more and for the U.S. to try to do less. And yet, at that same time, um, it's a very problematic trade-off to make. So we're not promoting huge troop reductions while we do a third offset. But there may still be some room there for uh, on the margins. And finally, the power web, which is another tool for leveraging allies and partners. We're talking about the hub and spokes and going beyond it. We're talking about building up those spokes. Maybe the gear was not the right engineering metaphor. But it is something that we've looked at, which is trying to essentially promote uh, the natural role that the ROK and others can play in the region um, together. And that includes even on missile defense with Japan, the US, and the ROK. But there are many other uh, possibilities there in terms of the ROK in Southeast Asia and, and in the Indo-Pacific. Um, Seong-won, did you want to add anything? Uh, yes, uh, just to add 
two fingers on the fad issue. I would say that the, there's a huge difference in uh, deterring the use of actual use of nuclear weapons and impeding the development of these weapons, as well as there is a difference in uh, countering provocations that uh, against the states that have nuclear weapons. So that I would say is like uh, wearing a bulletproof vest and uh, China by uh, being against this is, my answer would be like China would, can have their own bulletproof vest if they want, but uh, why are they uh, doing that to us? And that's, well, uh, that's a very uh, simplified story, but uh, Regarding the, what Dr. Chong Il-wa said about the uh, electromagnetic railguns or maybe the directed energy weapons that might be used uh, in the future, I would say that uh, there's a reason that there's no missiles or torpedoes in Star Wars. Because <laughs> I would say that uh, yeah, these weapons will sometime, in some day, eventually uh, overcome the missile regime. And uh, I'm trying to do a uh, more deep, in-depth in research on this on my own, and I will happy to share it uh, in the future. And about uh, what Dr. Bechtel said about the Musadan, I, uh, it's interesting how probability counts in and math mathematics counts in to, to how, like, uh, like, actually what the possibility is of these uh, nuclear weapons. But we would have to think in the shoes of North Korean leaders as well. If there's actually at least, like, only 1% of uh, us intercepting the um, the nuclear missiles and that would mean a huge thing to North Korea as well because only if it's one percent uh, that, that would mean that there is a percent that uh, North Korea's uh, first preemptive use of these weapons would be counted which will end up in the in the regime being collapsed so we have to think it uh, the other way around as well. Thank you very much let me go back to the discussions and give them 30 seconds each if they have anything to say Mark 30 seconds. <clears throat> I see your watch there does hundreds, hundreds of a second, so you're, right. you're watching. I'd, just like, I'd like to applaud uh, Dr. Ilwa Jung for talking about the United Nations. It's often overlooked and should not be. That's really important. There are three things the UN does just off the top of the head. One is there's a UN military command in South Korea that has uh, partners who are countries are obligated to defend the armistice. So someday when North Korea collapses, if it does, I think the UN military command is going to have a role to play. Uh, an important one. Uh, second, the UN has a carrot right, in terms of the SCAP, the Economic and Social Committee for Northeast Asia. It concludes North and South Korea, China, Russia, Japan, Mongolia, and actually functions. So for those that believe you should not totally isolate North Korea, SCAP's a place where they meet other countries to work on bird migration. North Koreans are weirdly honest in giving SCAP numbers on how bad their air pollution is and how few paved roads they have. So North Korea is part of that SCAP system. And finally, the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights, which you'll hear about tomorrow, that the UN operated, was a hugely important development to rally international opinion behind the fact North Korea's human rights abuses are unacceptable. There's now a UN office in Seoul that's sole job is to collect evidence against North Korean officials' provincial prosecutions. So you may say that China can veto UN actions against North Korea, but it can't in every case. The UN has its own life that goes on, and it's very helpful in, on the peninsula. Thank you, Mark. Bruce? Did, did Mark just bring up bird migration, I sir? I sure did. Yeah, he did. He did talk about okay. birds. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I had to squeeze it in some place. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd just like to comment again on the missiles. Um, I'd like to remind everyone, if, uh, North Korea has about 200 Musadon missiles. They have about 50 launchers, according to unclassified data. So... Can we shoot down all f a volley of 50 Musadon missiles if they're fired at the same time? I don't know. I have my doubts. But I think with BMD, combined BMD, I think we got a lot better shot at it. And I think that applies to other things, such as, obviously, if they get the KN-08 operational, which is a missile that can hit. I talked about that earlier. Um, and I'll take just 10 more seconds to just talk about, they have a capability that they're working on, and we've heard about their submarine launch ballistic missile and the submarine that goes with it. I think that really adds to what they're almost creating as a triad now to target the United States. So just something to think about. Dr. Joe. Yes, sir. Uh, nowadays, uh, Boeing 7747 Equipped, uh, boarded the uh, very big uh, equipment uh, have been try has been trying to uh, to uh, 
to, uh, to, how can I say, to intercept the, uh, the um, nuclear weapon, uh, nu 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 nuclear weapon finding, intercepting, and the dist destruction. And I'm not sure the result uh, of itself. However, they are, they are still continuing to increase their capability nowadays, I, I think. So that kind of the scientific, uh, scientific uh, endeavor should be shared with the South Korean scientists. We have a quite a, a big pool of super science, scientists. So we hope they can, uh, they can participate in the very big, uh, very uh, important uh, project and also, nowadays, uh, I'm not sure it is true or not, 83% of anti-missile uh, test has been successful against the invading, uh, invading uh, uh, missile uh, projection. So I think that that kind of skill has been developed day by day. So I think that uh, it is not uh, uh, lazy work to do our research to increase our enhancement to to make a counter uh, uh, to to counter the, the enemy's uh, mi um, missile attack so i think that uh, in 1944 your manhattan project has been very surprising and uh, unexpected project, however, that produced a big result. So now it is time to have another big project like Manhattan to counter that nuclear uh, weapon sterilization and uh, missile uh, counter, counter, uh, countering measures, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll now open the questions to the floor. I ask that you direct them to one of the panel members. And I ask that they are in the form of questions <laughs> rather than speeches. So let me start right here. You had your hand up first, sir. Uh, I'm Peter Kang from Korea Freedom Alliance. Uh, I would like to quickly congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Chung's uh, uh, imaginative uh, proposal to end the whole uh, the <clears throat> end of the world uh, uh, war and uh, permanent peace. Uh, I hope that there is somebody who will do, do that. But my, my main question is, uh, there has been a lot of uh, talk about uh, uh, North Korea, North Korean army cannot possibly attack South Korea because uh, once it attacks, the North Korean regime will be gone. Now, on the other hand, uh, other people will say that we cannot t disturb North Korea because uh, North Korea will raise war. So I have been forever confused about this. And because of uh, this, uh, because of the, uh, the idea that uh, North Korea, we cannot attack North Korea, uh, you know, a long time ago, uh, n uh, 1994, uh, agreed a framework around that time there was a, uh, idea of attacking, stopping North Korea's nuclear development, uh, that uh, was, uh, you know, not carried out because of war. And it looks like uh, uh, decades, decades of time we are wasting until North Korea accomplishes uh, uh, nuclear uh, attack capability, and we are absolutely doing, doing nothing. What we are doing is basically keep uh, uh, Developing deterrence, uh, continuing uh, continuing uh, military exercise, and but uh, do nothing to stop North Korea's nuclear development. Uh, so, uh, if somebody can tell me uh, the uh, compare uh, the argument of uh, uh, North Korea cannot attack South Korea, and we cannot attack South Korea because North Korea will attack South Korea, how how can these two statements be most both true? Dr. Cronin, would you like to take that one on to start with? Well, it's a terrific um, conundrum, isn't it? Um, 
and, and maybe they can't be both true. The question is, how do we know which one is more true than the other? And that's where the predicament lies. Um, North Korea can create enormous damage and can stoke a nuclear war because if it has nuclear weapons, it could create a regional nuclear war that would bring China and the United States in. Um, so there's no doubt that North Korea could create very devastating things without necessarily being able to invade the South as maybe Kim Il-sung once envisioned. I think in general, North Korea's strategy, if it has one, even under Kim Jong-un, it's still to try to press away that, with that wedge the United States off the peninsula. Once that happens, and if you're a nuclear-armed state versus a non-nuclear South Korea, maybe that equation looks more favorable. Um, so over the long term, they, they may be still just buying survival in the first instance, but they may also be still playing for changing the equation in the future. We're obviously fighting back by in preserving this unstable peace, um, trying to engage and change North Korean behavior, not very successfully, as you point out. They're still getting closer and closer to being able to deploy the nuclear weapon systems that Dr. Bechtold and others have talked about. Um, we need to do more, and there are strategies for trying to do more. Um, the current South Korean government under President Park geun hye has done a 180-degree reversal in effect of policy, although she wouldn't call it that. Um, since the January uh, nuclear test. There's been a very hard, hard approach taken, and the fact that 2270, the UN Security Council resolutions are part of that, U.S. unilateral sanctions are part of that, um, and strengthening deterrence for the RK-U.S. alliance is part of that, the ongoing trilateral missile defense exercise between and among uh, ROK-U.S. Japan that's going on right now, on the margins of the RIMPAC uh, exercise are part of that. None of these things is decisive. <laughs> um, you want that permanent peace. We all do. Yeah, we want permanent peace. We want decisive results. Ever since the Korean War was fought, I think we found out this was a limited war where it was very difficult to have a winner. There definitely could be losers. So um, we don't want to lose. <laughs> um, we'd like to press our narrative and our case with our values and our interests in terms of us an alliance. Um, and I think our, our chances are favorable, but can we do it without the deployment of nuclear weapons from the north? I don't know. I, I think we need to try, but time is getting very short. I'm sorry, General Talele, I don't have a better answer. No, that's, that's, uh... <laughs> yes, ma'am. And I, too, uh, would like to thank Dr. Chung for bringing up um, the history of the UN's involvement on the Korean Peninsula because it raises the fundamental question um, that was supposed to be resolved by the UN. True, the UN did um, save South Korea, but it failed in its mission to establish a legitimate government on the Korean Peninsula. And so today we have a criminal regime governing one half and a democracy governing the other. So my question is, compared to the status quo in which we have a very sensitive and um, potentially volatile situation, wouldn't it be better to have a nuclear freeze, one that is verifiable, deeply verifiable, and includes um, a ban on any testing, also of missiles, and also an end to proliferation? but focus on the legitimacy of the North Korean government by demanding that they stop their crimes against humanity, open up their prison camps, uh, demand that in combination with the freeze, and then um, their, their reward in this would be to start engaging in economic development projects as President Park put forward in Dresden. Um, we would have maintained our military strength and, uh, and our very strong alliance with the ROK, um, but give an opening to this criminal regime to stop its crimes against its own people and also its illicit economy by having them develop legitimate 
economic development instead of relying on counterfeit U.S. dollars and selling meth. Great. Thank you. Dr. Cho, would you like to respond to that? Mark, I'll ask you also. Yeah, yeah. You said uh, North Korea will not attack South Korea. South Korea even uh, will not attack North Korea. If those are true, then uh, we're going to have a peace. But we are, we are not uh, in peaceful uh, situation. You know, the, uh, in the North Korea constitution, still uh, the integration of uh, South Korea into North Korea is still there. So the issue is uh, how, how to do it uh, from North Korea. I mean, North Korea with uh, nuclear weapon and North Korea without nuclear weapon, in trying to revivify South Korea, North Korea, it's going to make a big difference. So, I mean, it's a, it's a coercive use of no, nuclear weapon uh, can be expected. And also, like uh, Dr. Kim said this morning, we, we, can, we, 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 we can see uh, some uh, nuclear shadow, like coercive use of nuclear weapons. So, I mean, it, it's not a, not, a, not a big matter. I mean, we'll not attack the reverse is all true, but uh, the real fact is North Korea is with a nuclear weapon is a more important thing. I can't speak for the U.S. government now, but I used to. So I remember some of that. And the U.S. government's position on North Korean talks was that we would respond to a positive gesture from North Korea. But it had to be a real gesture. Uh, we would not start talks because we were invited to. We'd have to see them do something. Because in the past, the talks were, showed a lot of ill will, bad faith. So, and we did not specify what those steps should be. There's no test for North Korea. You have to do A, B, and C, and then we'll have talks. We sort of show us something. So I think that means if North Korea actually announced a freeze on its nuclear testing, its missile testing, I think that would get a positive response from the US. I think we would respond to that by saying, let's talk about it, how to verify that, what it means. But that has not happened. North Korea has not taken positive steps. And I think the reason why is because North Korea's nuclear program, to me, is more based on trying to keep the Kim regime in power that is aimed at us. I think it's a domestic issue. Um, there's reasons for it. It may be that Kim Jong-un believes that having a nuclear program puts more engineers and scientists in charge rather than uniform military. It may be an internal power struggle. It may be he believes nuclear program could lead to lower conventional weapons spending so he could save money, uh, do more economic reform. I'm not sure, but it's domestic. It's not about us. But if they wanted to start talking seriously, they could. We're waiting. Thank you, Mark. General Park. Thank you, General. Uh, today I see really a peculiar phenomenon regarding North Korea. You know, North Korea, small but very, very poor country in the world, surrounded by big nuclear powers, US, China, Russia, and Japan with you know high level of the uh, nuclear technology. But now the uh, North Korea are not scared by these big nuclear powers, but rather nuclear powers are scared by North Korea's continuation of you know the provocative nuclear and missile provocations. Whenever they faced North Korea's nuclear missile provocation, they used to convene meeting, six party talks, or sometimes the UN Security Council meeting, producing a series of sanction resolutions, most recently 2027, waiting and expecting some outcome from that uh, uh, sanction resolution, but only to be frustrated by North Korea's folder going to a higher level of their capability to threat the uh, South Korea and the United States and the region as a whole. Why is that? You know, the uh, North Korea still has the unfinished missile technology, the unfinished nuclear weapons and the uh, missiles. They are the SLPM, ICPM, still unfinished. 
But with that unfinished their weapon systems, they are not threatening the United States mainland. And the, the US and other countries, you know, used to produce kind of the uh, uh, sanction resolution. You know, once the, uh, I remember, once the Napoleon said that, when the enemy has staff meeting, my troops is maneuvering to envelop the enemy. But while the United Nations, the United Nations Security Council and six party talks uh, met together and have meeting, produce certain kinds of the resolution and agreements, North Korea continue to go forward, forward, to a stepped up level, the higher level of the nuclear capability and missile capability. Until when we should watch, we should see this kind of phenomena. Maybe sometime in the future, North Korea all of a sudden declare, oh, we have finished full-fledged nuclear and missile systems to threaten not only the uh, Korea, but Japan and US. So this is the reality that uh, I'm the seeing these days. So that's why the, uh, this morning, Dr. Kim Tae-woo and Dr. Song Dae-sung, they, they suggested uh, various kind of the, uh, uh, policy ideas to overcome this kind of the, uh, the dilemma of the situation. So I, I would like to listen uh, from the, my American colleagues, uh, Kwanin or Dr. Bechtel, or even from General Tillery, from you. Why is that? Why still we are so incapable of dealing with such a small, poor country like North Korea. Thank you. Bruce, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I'm sorry, you have 30 I just seconds. woke up. Uh, um, the, in response to your question, well, first I'll, I'll, I'll comment on, on what this young lady said, and that's we have a precedent for North Korea freezing its nuclear program as part of our policy at Yongbyon, and it didn't work because they had their, their plutonium program frozen at Yongbyon, and they had their ATU program over here. The problem with the North Koreans is verification and trustworthiness, and it, it's non-existent. Um, moving on to what, what you said, the North Koreans finished their Taepodong, just a reminder, they have now launched it successfully twice through three stages. That means they have the capability to launch a three-stage ICBM at the United States of America. The Taepodong is not designed for Chejudo, trust me. Um, we also saw them successfully launch a Musudan on the exact trajectory that they would need to to hit Guam. Again, major loss of beach bars. We don't want that, General. So um, I think that North Korea has a lot of capabilities you would not expect from such a small country, but they feel they need to have them. Whatever their motivation is to have nuclear weapons, they have them. Whatever their motivation is to have missiles that can strike the United States sovereign territories, they have them. And thus, we must do what's important, in my opinion, if, if it's not engagement, then it should be containment. And there's nothing wrong with containment. It's a policy that worked for 40 years during the Cold War. The, the only thing I would add, uh, General Park, is uh, there are many in this room who were engaged in four-party, six-party, two-party talks, and they probably can answer the question better than I. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, they have failed over a long period of time. North Korea has never lived up to one agreement that they've ever made. And the fact is, is as we look at what Dr. Bechtel just said, I think providing peace and stability on the peninsula, protecting the people of South Korea, and deterring adventurism, more adventurism by North Korea is, is a way to go. North Korea has nuclear weapons today. We all should look in the mirror because we've allowed them to have nuclear weapons today, and we've allowed them to have long-range missiles because when we asked the question in the 90s, and I, there are many of us in this room that ask the question, should we allow North Korea to develop intercontinental long-range missiles? And should we allow them to develop nuclear weapons? And the answer was it would be intolerable. 
Well, we're at the point now. It's intolerable, and our best solution now is strong deterrence, containment, and try to work around the issues. To think about a conflict on the peninsula is abhorrent to me. Even though we are strong, we would win, but the fact is the devastation and the death and devastation would be more than any of us should be able to cope with. And I don't know who said it this morning. I think it was General John. We have children on the, in the Republic of Korea that it's our responsibility to make sure we make the right decisions. If I, I may, maybe yeah. just, just to add a thought to that. Um, we probably over, overemphasize nuclear program at the expense of thinking about the conventional threat to South Korea. There's North Korea artillery, as we all know, within 30 miles of South Korea is Seoul. They can create huge damage right. with what they have now without a nuclear program. But look at what North Korea has not been able to do. Uh, you say that the powers are afraid of North Korea, but they've not stopped us from having military exercises as hard as they've tried. Uh, they've not forced U.S. forces off the uh, peninsula as they, much as they'd like to. They've not stopped South Korea from broadcasting in North Korea. So North Korea often threatens uh, to take military action to try to force things to happen, and we stand up to them. So there's more than one side to it. Absolutely. How do you explain that North Korea is now dominating the political security scene in North East Asia? Not only on the Korean Peninsula, but North East Asia as a whole. You know, they behave like that, mm -hmm. like to dominate all the security in this region. How do you explain it? So what is the, you know, the way? By what means we can stop North Korea to behave like that? I mean, asked that way, General Park, it's a tough question to answer, but I don't accept the, the, the premise that North Korea is dominating Northeast Asia. North Korea is gesticulating wildly and certainly trying to dominate the headlines. Um, I did a CNN headline the other day where I got to you know, stand behind Kim Jong-un calling the, you know, let's kill the American um, uh, you know, born out of wedlock people. Uh, there was another word they used. Um, and and um, <laughs> the... Um, the, the one point I'd push back on is the alliance is not afraid of North Korea. Um, we will, as General Talali suggested at lunchtime, fight to die. I'll fight to die for the Korean people. Um, we're not scared, but we are risk averse because we have a lot to lose. We have built prosperous democracies. We have a lot of global interests. Um, North Korea has a very singular interest, save the regime and the Kim family dynasty. Uh, first and foremost, and it's able to therefore project uh, a certain singularity in terms of a focus that we just don't have. And because, as Dr. Bechtol suggested, containment roughly works, even while it keeps proliferating on the peninsula, um, you know, we're, we're coming to a point. But I agree with you, uh, General Park, that we need to do a, you know, even a more active job as an alliance to figure out how to counteract what North Korea is doing. And that I think we are in, in heated agreement on. The question is, how do we do this intelligently? Are there any, on this side of the room, I have not, uh, please. Um, hi, my name is Travis Lindsay. I'm an intern at the Korea Economic Institute. Uh, and my question is for Dr. Bechtel and Mr. Kim. Um, in the lead up to THAAD deployment, or excuse me, in the lead up to UNSCR 2270, uh, the United States and South Korea temporarily suspended uh, their discussions on that. Um, and Danny Russell with the Department of State subsequently commented that there's no link linkage between uh, THAAD deployment and USCR 2270. Um, do you believe that there was some sort of quid pro quo, uh, either explicit or implicit, between China and the United States um, with the UNSCR 2270? Um, and will that have implications on whether THAAD is deployed in the near future? Mr. Kim, let me... Have you start? Well, um, I would be very excited to cover that uh, you know issue where if I were uh, you know the Voice of American Radio Free Asia reporter. I mean, I used to work for them well, for 12 years, <laughs> but now as a you know a, uh, researcher, um, I would say I don't have any inside information. But what I understand is the UN sanctions, it took longer than before because of this that issue. China was strongly opposing to this idea. So uh, that's one of the reasons that we couldn't see uh, China uh, you know, uh, moving forward uh, earlier than we expected. 
And uh, one more thing, uh, you know, again, I think when, when you're dealing with this uh, uh, sensitive issues, uh, we also need to look at what's going on in, in, within South Korea, the domestic politics. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, I read a lot of, uh, you know, commentaries or even uh, editorials speculating that there must be some behind the scene deals between the US and China uh, on this specific issues, meaning uh, without Seoul's knowledge, uh, UN, the US and China would uh, seek uh, parallel uh, negotiations, doing both you know, nuclear uh, negotiations with North Korea and all, also the peace treaty. Whether or not that was uh, true, uh, I would also uh, again emphasize that th that was the speculation very popular, although it was very temporarily, among the South Korean uh, you know, opinion leaders. So I think we should uh, do more, uh, you know, make more efforts to uh, you know, manage that kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, speculations or some, uh, um, some you know, trust issue. Bruce, do you want to address that? In my opinion, sir, and, and, and uh, what would you say your name was? Uh, Travis. Nice to meet you, Travis. In my, in my opinion, I think that's just an unproven rumor. I mean, because the talks to, to deploy that are still going on, and they're very serious talks. It appears it's going to happen. And we did talk to Chinese into putting in the most serious sanctions they've ever put in. But I'm so happy you asked that question, because I want to say one thing. If we had not imposed any more sanctions at all, we could have put much more of a hurt locker on the North Koreans than we are currently. And that would have been simply by implementation. Sanctions mean nothing without implementation. They're no better than the paper they're written on. And the most we ever hurt North Korea, as a lot of people in this room know, was in 2005 when we went after Banco Delta. Delta. Yes. And the Treasury Department and the State Department worked with our allies in Asia and elsewhere and literally said, if Banco Delta Asia puts North Korean money in their bank, there will be no American money in that bank. And that snowballed all over Asia. Banks all over Asia started pushing North Koreans out. And within a year, North Korean diplomats were carrying suitcases full of cash to Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, because nobody else would take their money. This is true. Now, we've never gotten back to that point. Unless and until we get back to the point where the Treasury Department says, this bank, this bank, this bank, we're not going to allow American funds in there, which means other, if North Korean funds are in there, which means the Europeans, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Singaporeans, they're going to start pulling their funds out too. We can really hurt the North Koreans. We can really contain their illicit networks. And everybody knows how to do it. It's just nobody's been willing to pull the trigger yet. Dr. Cronin. There's no quid pro quo. Um, yes, there's not an opportune time to poke China in the eye when you're trying to seek their support for UN Security Council resolutions on sanctions. Um, the technical alliance preliminary study is finished, um, and I believe the alliance will make an announcement. The political will is there because the actions of North Korea in 2016, and that's, what's over, that's what overcame the concern about China, and that's a, that's a consensus, I believe, in the government, in the Blue House and in the White House, and I would expect to see a decision at the 2 plus 2 meeting in late July. Look, we have five minutes left. We have a lot of questions. Please point your question to one of the panel members and ask it as a question right here. Thank you, General. I have one question, uh, which goes to Dr. Jung Sanman, who touched upon the issue of uh, North Korean nuclear threat from the sea. Well, as suggested by Dr. Jung, uh, the test firings of indigenous North Korean SLBM of recent days, uh, although its success is uh, debatable, has drawn great attention to the balance of power between the uh, two Korean navies. The development this development certainly poses a new challenge for the Republic of Korean Navy and also for its ally, the U.S. Navy, and even for the uh, Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. This challenge requires uh, effective countermeasures using underwater-based anti-submarine warfare capabilities as well as improved naval ASW cooperation between the three navies to deter North Korean maritime threat, both conventional and nuclear. So unfortunately, unfortunately for the Rang Navy, 
there are very few good countermeasures available, and the situation is complicated by a heated debate between those who believe that North Korean deployment of a fully fledged and effective SLBM capability is not imminent, and those who are, who are convinced that the recent test firing represent an urgent threat. So in any case, I think the Rang Navy needs to strengthen its readiness to respond to such North Korean SLBM and submarine threat and must seek a way to secure strategic credibility for its deterrent posture. So uh, my question is that from your perspective, Dr. Jung, uh, specifically, which, what is the best and realistic countermeasures to respond to such SLBM threat from the sea? That's my question. Thank you. 30 seconds, please. Okay. North Korea bought uh, two uh, Golf class submarines from uh, former Soviet Union and uh, it reverse engineered and made a simple class. There are three ways uh, we can control the submarine. One is to control the submarine at its source, like a port. The other one, the other one is to control the submarine at uh, what do you call the uh, choke point. It's a channel where the submarine must pass. The other one is uh, to find the submarine in uh, the open area. So best way to chase and kill the, the North Korea SLBM submarine is to chase from its source, then uh, if situation allowed, then uh, you know, destroy. So what are, the, what are the, the platform we can use to, to do that? I guess uh, the platform may be, may be used as long as uh, it operates uh, rather longer time underwater uh, situations so like, uh, you know, the uh, nuclear power submarine. Uh, anyway, so that's the best way to cope with uh, those uh, SLBM threat. Thank you. Don, last question. Question, please. Last question, right back there. Well, I, Sorry. I guess I'll address, since you wanted to a specific person, I guess to Dr. Cronin. Uh, the U.S. and ROK have reached, reached some kind of an agreement a year or two ago limiting what the ROK could do in nuclear reprocessing. Uh, I wonder whether you think this agreement is too uh, inhibiting and what you think of uh, the whole debate over pyro processing, which has not come up, so perhaps you might be able to enlighten us. Thank you. It's a great question. I'm not sure I'm prepared to enlighten anybody today um, on that issue. Uh, the technology is moving, and um, so any agreement that was made earlier may already be obsolete. So it's the kind of discussion that nuclear experts and, and other people involved in the alliance need to come together. Actually, maybe Bruce Bechtel would have a better answer than I. <laughs> Uh, the last, well, as you know, they, they have inked a deal, um, and, and I'm an American, a proud American, as you know, and uh, I, I still think that uh, the South Koreans kind of got the raw end of the deal. Um, I, I, I think the South Koreans have shown that they are, are a nation state that follows international rule of law, so I don't think they'd try to do any, for lack of a better term, slick things, or they'd try and convert that stuff to uh, weaponized material. Uh, but nevertheless, the agreement was reached, and it appears, at least for the next two years, that that's, that's what the ROC and the U.S. government are going to continue to do. Will that, will that change in the near future? It might. Thank you, Bruce. Let me uh, ask you to thank the panel with a round of applause for vibrant discussion. And I will turn it over to Dave.